bro. Cheers for coming on today. No problem. Thanks for having me. How you been? I'm good. I'm good. You know, uh, long days, longer nights, but get the job done every day. So looking fresh still. More. Yeah, definitely. Always. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me a bit about your background. Let's, let's go with that. Start from wherever you want. Okay. So basically, uh, since I was, since I was a kid, I've always been involved in sports, athletics. I've always loved to really build my body up, get stronger, um, be, you know, capable of doing things efficiently and optimally as much as I possibly can. All the way since, you know, I was eight years old, I started playing football. I did some Kempo Karate too as well. So I was well versed in, uh, in martial arts aspect, uh, traditional martial arts. And uh, after that, kind of kind of played football all the way up into college, went to Alabama State University, played strong safety there. After I was done with college, we, uh, my family moved from South Florida to a small town in Port St. Lucie, where then I met UFC veteran Dean Thomas, mm -hmm. where then I started to train in mixed martial arts. Uh, trained that for, I don't know, a little bit over 10 years. Uh, turned pro when I was around 21. And, uh, you know, I've been a pro all the way up until I was about 27, where I then had to pretty much um, retire from the sport just due to injury, due to uh, concussions. Not so much from the sport of MMA, but more so from the sport of football. Mm. Uh, at that time, I ended up, you know, doing personal training here and there, training my, training my teammates and uh, training some local high school kids. You know, at, at other strength and conditioning gyms, I got my start at uh, a small strength and conditioning gym called Samson's. And uh, from there, I learned a little bit under Tony Montgomery, who's a uh, he's like a power lifter. He's uh, he works with uh, right now. He's out in. Or Oregon with um, with uh, Chris Duffin. So yeah. that's a, you know, big time power lifter there. So, I mean, I learned a lot from them. And I got my background pretty much in powerlifting and strongman. Um, after after that, around the age of 22, I ended up opening up my own facility, um, doing some boot camps and uh, just general fitness, personal training, things like that. Grew my gym. It was called the Roof Fitness Performance DFP for short. Grew that gym from an 800 square foot like storage closet into an 11,000 square foot like mega facility where we had all types of training going on strength and conditioning, MMA, boxing, just pretty much everything you needed at that point in time in that small town of Port St. Lucie. Yeah. Uh, at that time, after that, um, I began to compete in other sports. You know, I did a little bit of bodybuilding here and there. I'd done some strongman competitions. Now, now you know, more recently, I, I compete in powerlifting. If you ever see any of my videos on Instagram or anything like that, you can see that I'm a competitive powerlifter now. Mm. Um, but I got the opportunity because of American Top Team being my home gym since I was a fighter. Uh, I got the opportunity to go down to headquarters and actually pretty much audition for the job of strength and conditioning coach there. The old strength and conditioning coach was actually leaving. Yeah. And Dean Thomas had basically I called him up. I asked him if he had any fighters that he wanted me to work with since I had time on my hands. And I still wanted to be a part of the sport after I retired. So. Um, I guess the main thing was I just wanted to be there. I wanted to be still a part of it because I, I, I pretty much loved the sport all my life. And I put a lot of uh, a lot of time into it. So mm. um, I went down there and the first day I had to train by myself. I had to train Dustin Poirier, Tisha mm. Torres, King Mo the Wall and Hector Lombard. And they all loved the training. Um, I, I came back. They asked me to come back for a second week. After that, I ended up just basically staying there for a year and a half now and you know, um, just recently we, uh, you know, we worked with Joanna Young Jacek on her title defense. Um, you know, cool. Dustin Poirier has got another fight coming up. King Mo the Wall again. You know, just just maintaining. You know, and well, actually, I don't like the word maintaining. We're progressing daily um, with all the fighters there at American Top Team, and we're actually building to obviously be the best gym in the world there from a mixed martial arts standpoint. But that's what's really going on for right now, and uh, you know. If time goes by, we're going to keep going. I'll, I'll probably do something that I want to do, you know, as far as my crazy mind. I always want to make sure that I'm testing myself on a daily basis. So, you know, I'm actually going back to school. Um, I'm going to go ahead and work to get my Ph.D. And I want to actually get my doctorate in physical therapy. So, you know, nothing ever stops. And I, I barely have time to myself anyways, but I always like to add on. So 
yeah. your way. No, I mean, it's good that you've got that uh, mental- mentality because a lot of people, I mean, I, I believe that, in my opinion, I believe that everyone has that mentality. It's whether or not they impl- implement the correct actions to sort of unlock it, if that makes sense, um, yeah, to, to be able to be proactive and always wanting to achieve and challenge themselves on a daily basis. And I think yeah. in society at the moment, maybe a lot of people are lacking that. Do you know what I mean? Lacking that aspect. We're kind of sleepwalking into oblivion almost. Yeah, I think it's a lot of... The, the problem nowadays is people don't like to get uncomfortable. Mm. They get stuck in their ways. They get complacent. You know, um, they just... They want to feel happiness, but happiness doesn't involve you staying still for a long period of time. Yeah. I think that to constantly grow, otherwise you're degressing every day. No, I agree. Like uh, nothing worse than just being sort of stagnant in life. I guess just in one position for ten years, no progression. You know, in your job, whatever yeah. it is, that's where the unhappiness sort of starts to come. Ten years down the line, you're really thinking, "Fuck, like, what have I done? Do you know what I mean? What have I yeah. achieved?" Like, and everyone kind of wants to leave like a legacy of some sort. I well, most people do if you're awake. Well- to it, I guess. Most people, most people just want to live their life day to day, you know, and that's that's an easy way out. That's that's the sucker's way out, in my opinion. Yeah, no, I, um, I share that same view with you. Um, so what like motivates you? I think I think self-improvement, constant self-improvement every day. Um, motivation, you motivation is basically something that drives you, mm. but you have to have a why to create your own motivation in a sense. I don't think that, and I was just talking to my client today about this, but I don't think that people really are committed to a why of their own self accomplishment. Hmm. Um, I think that if you have a why, it has to be something from an outer source. My why, particularly, is my family. Yeah. You know, uh, my son, my daughters, my wife. I want to leave a legacy for them to make them feel proud about who they have as a father and a husband, you know, but if it was for my own selfish reason, I don't think that you could actually stay with that, that goal or that vision because you're going to find an easy way out because you think that at that time, I don't really need to do that right now. Mm. You see what I'm saying? But if you have a why for an outside source, your son doesn't know that you can't, you don't feel like getting up. Your son doesn't understand or your daughters don't understand that you don't feel like waking up at 5 a.m. To, to go work and to provide. But if you do it for yourself, well, then you can have self-doubt self, you know, self doubt, and mm-hmm. actually talk yourself out of doing something that you're supposed to be doing, which is grinding every day to get better. Yeah, I mean, you, you've almost got um, rather like you've got an accountability, do you know what I mean? Someone that's saying like, you know, you've got a reason to go out and provide, you know, it's your, your family, their whole, it's kind of their, your accountability. If you don't deliver, they suffer rather than yourself. Obviously you could just be like, if you had no one to, you didn't have that, why that, that third party, you could just lay in bed all day, not get up. And you know, the only person that's accountable for those actions is yourself and fuck it kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, I, I could be like that. I, and, and people are, some people are self-motivated. They, they do it for themselves. But at the end of the day, there has to be something bigger in mind. You know, um, I, I, it's, it's too small of a scale to really, you know, I want to do it for me. Well, you want to do it for you. Well, how selfish are you at that point? You know what I mean? I think you need to have something else to work towards, to work for, you know. No, that makes sense. Um, so obviously you touched on your strength and conditioning. Um, like explain to me sort of the fundamentals of strength training. I mean, strength and conditioning or physical preparation is something that you're basically helping a certain individual athlete, client, whatever it may be, um, get better physically, mentally, uh, phys- from a physiological standpoint, from a biomechanical standpoint, from a performance standpoint. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and at that whole time is a wide spectrum of things that you have to accomplish at that point which is fixing dysfunction, um, getting them stronger, getting them more conditioned from an endurance standpoint. And that can be from a wide spectrum of, uh, of modalities. Uh, mm. But the main thing is just getting them to perform at their peak condition f- 
for a common goal. So for the um, on the like nutritional side of that, there's a lot into like carb cycling. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, I don't. I assume you call it the same over where you are. Where, like, how do you, how for say a performance athlete, what's their diet? Say like eight weeks and then like a couple of days. Is there like a radical change if that makes sense? Because it's if they're not like cutting, no, go on, go on. Sorry. Well, it depends on the sport too. Mm. It depends on the sport. It depends on if they're cutting weight. Um, there's, there's a lot of factors involved in that particular, you know, realm of nutrition, but for standardized performance, you have to think of the fuel sources, right? Mm -hmm. Your main fuel sources for, for energy would be carbohydrates and fats. Um, then your proteins are your building blocks of muscle. Those are something that you need to actually re rebuild and regenerate, you know, for, for your muscle tissue to actually grow and to withstand strength. With your carbohydrates and your fats, those are your energy sources that you need to do work. So, um, you know, I always want to make sure that my athletes are having adequate amount of carbohydrate intake to withstand the training sessions that they do, plus to recover properly from the training beforehand so they can, you know, from a, from a fighter's perspective, these guys are training, you know, two or three times daily. Mm. So they have to be recovered fast and they have to have their nutrition on point at all times. So they can't be starving themselves. They can't have non-adequate amount of water intake. They need to be basically feeding their body like it's a fine-tuned machine on a constant basis. Um, as far as carb cycling, that's more for, I would say, it's more for aesthetic reasons. Um, you know, obviously, I've, I've done some bodybuilding. I've worked with some, you know, physique and aesthetic athletes. Mm-hmm. Um, carb cycling does work. I've seen it work from a practical application standpoint, and there is some science to back it up. But I do believe that from an athletic performance standpoint, it's not really conducive for the the progression of the of the athlete in general. Um, they should always have some adequate amount of carbohydrate intake, some fats, some protein. You should never really deprive them of their natural nutrient sources. No, it makes make, <laughs> makes sense to me in that in that sense. Your body, obviously, a lot of people know their own bodies as well, so. They, even though their nutrition's on point, they may be like, d- does it ever get like tinkered with, if that makes sense? So say for yourself, you're training for a fight, your nutritionist has given you a program, but, um, you know, after four weeks of training, you're like, do you know what? Fuck me, I'm suffering loads with energy. Like, does your nutritionist then go, right, maybe we need to change this? Is there like, yeah, an well, adaptive process? Yeah, I mean, everybody is different. And, and if somebody who gives you a standard nutrition plan it's it's very it's not it's not going to be optimal for the fighter for the athlete whatever the case may be because everybody is different everybody has different needs you know everybody um you know as far as like fuel sources everybody um can adapt to different situations but the case may be that one guy might be able to work off higher fats and mm-hmm. another guy might be able to work off higher carbs you know so you don't want to have one set plan for everybody it has to be specified for that particular fighter, for that particular athlete, client, whatever the case may be. Um, but I went on a rant. What, what else? Send a question again. No, no, that that was cool. You answered it basically. It was just whether whether um, you know, like a fighter uh, after two weeks of training, they're feeling low, like energy. Does their nutritionist kind of step in and go, okay, we need to increase this, or is yeah. it always like their nutritionist is just bang on point every time? Do you know what I mean? Or is there that process? No. No, I mean, I, I, he's human. You know, he's going to make mistakes either way. Um, but even as a coach, as a, as a strength coach, we're constantly evaluating the situation every single day. Um, Auto regulation is a big key factor in every, every uh, training session that we do. You know, especially when you got multiple training sessions going on at a single day. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the same goes for the nutrition side of it. You know, training may pick up. And different energy sources may need more, you know, you may need more adequate amount um, for that time being. You know, if you're off season, out of camp, you may not have to worry about it. Um, you know, but if you're in camp and you're training hard, you know, you might want to have a little bit more carbohydrates. Now, it depends on if you're cutting weight or not. If you're talking about a fighter, a wrestler, grappler, you know, something like that, yeah. even like a power lifter or, or, you know, any sport that requires a weight, you know, a weight cut. Um, you have to be mindful of that, you know, and I don't, I personally don't believe in cutting more than 12 to 15 pounds, um, 
just from a performance standpoint, mm -hmm. you're not going to be able to adequately bring back that amount of performance that you could have if you didn't cut that, you know, that 20 to 30 pounds, you know, in a day or so. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of guys that do it right. Um, George Lockhart is one of them for, for you know, for MMA. Yeah. And, um, you know, I work closely with him a lot of the times with Dustin Poirier. And, uh, you know, I think that he, he understands the process, but he also understands the sports, which is really good. Mm. Um, and, and same goes for, uh, you know, a lot of others. But you got some people that go into it as far as, you know, from a performance standpoint, they're putting athletes into a program or nutrition, you know, based diet yeah. that's depicted upon an aesthetic way of doing a diet, which is not the case. It's totally different. There's a lot of different factors. Sounds very in depth, man. Like a lot of hard work just to kind of tailor it maybe to someone's needs. So, I yeah. mean, I mean, I <laughs> weight cuts for the guys, man. But I'm telling you, it's very, it's an intricate, detailed approach mm. that you have to be ready for, and it has to be every, day. it has to be an everyday like checkup, yeah. you know, uh, because like I said, there is a lot of auto regulation. There's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of like. Okay, how you feeling today? All right, we got to change something like here, something there. Mm -hmm. You know, um, once you get it, once you understand the athlete, then you can kind of coast it out. But it, it's a lot of trial and error in the first, you know, first go around yeah. with a lot of. Athletes. I mean, um, that's like a lot of personal trainers over here in in England, and you may have it. I don't know in America, we kind of just funnel out a basic nutritional plan or give them a tailored nutritional plan that's it be on your way you know good luck and and yeah. so a lot of the time like a lot of people that are training just in the gym are not seeing like maximum results because they don't have that tinkering process and a lot of people maybe not educated as much it's kind of just like yeah trust what i'm saying here you go take it and run with it yeah. so um yeah. obviously i've seen on your instagram some of your your training videos um like in the, with your clients um mm -hmm. you use like resistance bands and it's i saw like one of them where they were hopping off a box onto like one leg and um i think one of them was wearing a resistance band and like moving a plate around with his foot i, mm -hmm. I don't know if like obviously i know you upload it but you upload quite a lot of content so you might not know specifically what i'm on about but um like explain the process behind that because a lot of people like it's sort of when i'm looking at that training i'm thinking what's going on here if that makes sense yeah well what bands pretty much do is give accommodated resistance mm. um it gives a steady flow of resistance so that you don't have to worry about an eccentric uh component to it or a slowing down component um when you're using bands like let's say for instance a band a banded bench press a lot of the time if you're trying to create maximum force and maximum force output you don't want to have a slowing down process of that bar path and a lot of the times when you're obviously when you have a bar in your hand, if there's nothing to detach that from, you know, your own inertia, basically what's going to happen is that bar, you're going to have to slow that bar down. Otherwise, it's going to fly off, you know, fly out of your hands. Hmm. So what the bands do, it actually gives you that accommodated push down resistance. So you have to fight against the bands um, and you can basically explode through the movement and create a greater force output um, through that movement with bands. Uh, that's the same thing, you know, if I were to do this, and I'm actually going to do it next week, but I'm going to actually have, you know, banded medicine ball throws to where you don't have to slow down the process, plus you're getting that accommodated resistance with the with the bands. So you're getting explosive power movement with the force output from the band resistance. So See. now you're creating a lot, of, a lot of change, a lot of stimulus in just one movement pattern. Which Does is that help, awful. like, punching power and stuff like that? Is that, like, do you know what I mean? Because I can kind of visualize it in my head, someone explosively pushing a bench press up or with that resistance band, knowing that they can really force it up and knowing that they don't have to worry that it's going to fly off all over the place or whatever. That's kind of giving it that little 5% more that they're able to achieve because it's not just going off all over the place. Yeah, and it, but the only thing is that I always harp on it's good to have force output, good to have strong explosive power, but if you cannot control that power, it's useless. Mm. So we don't want to do anything that's going to make it look sloppy at the end of the movement. So if I throw a medicine ball, right, and it 
and I explode through and throw it as hard as I can, but I'm off balance and I fall on my face, what good is that? Yeah. It's the same thing on a punch. If I throw my punch and I and I go to throw it as hard as I can and I miss, I'm going to fall on my face. What good does that do? You mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? Yeah. You have to have control of that power, you know, but the good thing that the band does, it helps you control the power output and it makes you kind of stabilize your own intrinsic muscle to basically help you when it comes to when it carries over into a sports specific movement pattern do you know um have you noticed like the industry is moving over to sort of this like training and movement where people are doing like slam balls and things like that for conditioning rather than you know you, i know like squats and bench mm. presses and shoulder presses are still being used a lot but for a lot mm. of athletes are they going into more like training and movement than just the basic compound sort of training, if that makes sense. Is yeah, it so so? So I'm not I'm not opposed. Obviously, I'm 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 a powerlifter at heart. I'm not mm. opposed to the bilateral movements, but you have to uh, you know there has to be a good risk to reward ratio, um, and I think that med balls and jumps things like that puts the body in in in, in a better anatomical position. It it's less risk, high reward. Um, there's no external load on the spine, you know, coming down from a, a bilateral back squat or something like that. Again, I do believe in absolute strength with bilateral back squat with a deadlift. Obviously, you're going to create a lot of force output with those movement patterns. But when it comes to an explosive power movement, I don't think anything really beats a jump or a throw, yeah. you know, and then and the best power lifters in the world can tell you about that. Even the best powerlifting coach in the world, in my opinion, Louis Simmons, harps on, you know, med ball throws, box jumps, broad jumps. Look at, um, you know, if, you know, we can go back and look at Yuri Vereshansky's work when he talked about depth jumps and shock training. And this was what they did back in the day with, so with the old Soviet Union. Yeah. These guys were doing something right. Now, obviously, they had a little bit of help with some supplements but at the same time they knew what they were doing we took what they did and now we're actually getting um better from a strength and conditioning standpoint to actually get our athletes where they need to be at all times but i think that you know i never want to let go of my multi-joint bilateral movements but unilateral movements and and single joint movements do have their place mm -hmm. like anything in i'm never i'm never living in absolutes I always want to make sure that we have a large, you know, tool selection to put in our toolbox. That's it. Yeah. Do you think there's like a um, more of a, an injury risk on sort of like you said with like the bench pressing and the squatting because of the For pressure sure. rather than doing, say, a box jump or et cetera? I know that sounds like common sense, obviously, but do you, do you get my point? Like you can like tear your rotator calf more doing a bench press than, say, chucking a massive medicine ball across the room etc you, you can get hurt walking down the street it's mm. it's it has nothing to do with that it's really just it's coaches or or even athletes being lazy and not really working on the fundamental technique of that lift um and especially with sports athletes when we're talking about you know not just not talking about strength sports because that's obviously that's the sport at hand is lifting weights um but when it comes to just regular sport athletes i think that they you know when they're in the weight room, unless they like lifting weights, you know, it's kind of a burden to them. You know, my fighters, you know, with, you know, with the occasion few, you know, uh, none of them really like to lift weights and none of them really lifted weights before. So for me, it's all about fixing dysfunction, making sure that we're managing fatigue, having a better, you know, risk to reward ratio and making sure that they're properly doing the technique and being optimally technically sound on every lift so you don't have these problems. But I do think I see a lot of injury rates due to the fact that there's poor technique. And mm -hmm. even in the college football and, you know, and, and even in like the pro pro uh, rugby, I'm talking about American football. Yeah. Um, but there's there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that I see um, even at the highest level that they're doing things wrong. And that's just that's either laziness or they just they're a dumbass. <laughs> either way it's not good yeah you know I mean? yeah no um do you know much about um sort of conor mcgregor's training because i know he was doing some like weird movements across the floor and 
yeah. I can't really put my finger on like what techniques is called or what style is called, but he does all this weird body movements and I don't yeah. kind of get the thought process behind that too much. So his guy that he works with is, is uh, Ido Portel. I think I'm saying his name right, but he's a movement specialist. Um, the main thing is like he's just trying to he's just trying to basically um, move his body in different patterns to help him carry over into the cage. Obviously, it's working for him. You know, he's successful. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's other modalities, especially in MMA. Um, there's other aerobic systems that he needs to work other than just doing one absolute. It's just like for him, if you want to go from a sports specific perspective, it's just like him just, just training kickboxing or just training Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You have to put all of it together because it's a mixed aerobic system sport. You doing movement patterns is cool and all, no doubt, but you have to put everything into play. And we kind of seen that when he fought Nate. You know, I think that I think that uh, he was gassing. Was, yeah, well, it was it wasn't a, a I don't think it was a factor of his aerobic capacity. I think that he just never really felt that lactic buildup mm. like he did in that in that fight. And then once he got hit, once you get hit on the chin, your your oxygen tank goes. And if you keep getting hit, trust me, I've been there. Your 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 conditioning is gone to shit. Mm. So we basically seen that. And and at that time, you're kind of drowning. You know, it feels like you're drowning in water, to be honest. And he was looking, I don't know if he was looking for a way out, but he found it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I mean, um, when I watched the, the first fight with uh, Diaz, obviously, I, I know he tapped out and that, but he just, even though he was throwing those shots and that, he, he looked good, but he did look like he was, you know, puffing out a little bit um, because of yeah. grappling and stuff. The same with, um, even in the second fight, obviously, it was like fairly close. I know he won, but... He looked like he was losing stuff from the tank, and I think in the third round he was like Nate was pushing him up against the um, against the cage, and he was like kind of gassing a bit and running around. Yeah. And I think to myself like all the conditioning and training you're doing, you should you should be fine because you've got like Diaz who's just an absolute athlete. <laughs> so, so let me so let's talk a little bit about that though. What Nate does now, Nate does marathons, like he does triathlons. He's outstanding in his aerobic capacity, outstanding. Mm. But he matches what he does from his strengths. I'm not. A, I'm, I'm really. I'm. I'm not a, a true believer in what Nate does to get ready from a physical preparation standpoint because he doesn't. He doesn't. You know, put together all modalities or all aerobic systems together. Yeah. But what he does do is that he fights to the way he trains. So he doesn't explode ever. If you ever see Nate, it's always. It's slow, methodical. He kind of just picks you apart, mm. and he stays one, one, you know, one dimensional or not one dimensional, but one, uh, one speed the whole way through. And he, with accumulation, he ends up knocking guys out or just basically outworking them in in the cage. Can that be the best way to do it? It depends on the person. It depends on muscle fiber type. It depends on you know the genetic makeup. And he just has that capability. Him and his brother both have that capability. I think Connor's a little bit more fast twitch, slow twitch, medium dominant. So, I mean, he has to work both sides of the fence on that one. Yeah. Um, I, I just ended up finishing working with, uh, with Tyron Woodley. Totally. Yeah. Totally different, you know, athletic background and totally different genetic makeup. The way we condition him is that you want to make sure that he's still doing his strengths, which is anaerobic explosive power, right? a lactic but also being able to recover within 10 to 15 seconds yeah. because if it doesn't then somebody's going to pressure him and then he can lose you know his his uh his speed there so what you want to do is you want to make sure that he can still do his explosive movements but he can maintain a good level of conditioning so he can manage the storm and then go explode again so what basically basically what i would do is i would do a 10 to 12 second burst of energy and then he would do something like we would drop that from, let's say he was at 100 percent on his on his max effort explosive. Yeah. move. We would drop that around 40 percent and then he would coast for a little bit, maybe do a little shadow boxing, move around, get on his bike. And then he would explode again. And doing this over time under volume will actually help his situation. His situation is being explosive for a long period of time. That's where power endurance 
comes into play for somebody like him, for somebody like Hector Lombard, for somebody like uh, a new guy, uh, big heavyweight that I have. Uh, uh, his name's Walt, but I mean Walt Harris, and he's uh, you know same same type of same type of makeup, genetic makeup. Yeah, that's running with them. Somebody yeah. who, I mean, like, um, Tyrone Woodley's like when when he explodes. It's like a, a a lion being let out of a cage about to just this that hasn't been fed for like six days, just full yeah. on one hundred percent power and then you do notice it in his fights, obviously then he kind of coasts around a bit and then suddenly snap explosion again. Yeah. And obviously like the training that you said you've done with him has it is, you know, tailoring to his genetic build, if that makes sense. Yeah, so like for instance, if I were to train him like a Nate Diaz this would negatively negatively affect his performance because we're going against his natural abilities. Why would I do that? I want to I want to make sure that we're progressing in his natural ability mm. and make sure that he's doing the things that he needs to do to withstand a fight because that's just the way that's how I was when I was fighting. You know, that's obviously how he is. You know, so as long as you have a good game plan from a from a you know speci specificity standpoint, from a skill standpoint. In the fight itself, and Dean Dean Thomas, like I said, does a great job with him with his game plan. Duke Rufus, same. You know, they they understand his style, yeah. and they play to his style for his 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 game plan. You know, so it works out well. I, I'm not I'm, una, uh, I'm unable to pronounce her name. Um, Yo Johanna, Joanna. Yep. Young that? Yeah, that's it. I can never pronounce it. Um, what have you been doing with her? Because I've seen her a few times on your uh, Instagram. Have you what sort of training have you been sort of working with her? You don't have to give so, away your secrets. <laughs> uh, we don't need to. We don't. We don't hide anything anyway. So, it, uh, with Joanna, uh, you know, right now, she's pretty much out of camp. She, she doesn't have a fight lined up. So, what we want to do is we want to kind of build up her body, build up that joint integrity making sure that she's gaining a wide base of strength mm -hmm. um you know because you know how you know how tall is a pyramid as wide as its base yeah. so what it was we want to create a wide base so we can build from that once she gets into camp so we're doing a lot of like five by fives a lot of strength endurance work um explosive power still i still want to keep her explosive power up and her speed is her main you know her main attribute so we always want to keep that going but for now it's more about pounding away the weights and getting her ready to go um, you know, so when she gets in the camp, all we really have to do is, is get her peaked and ready to go when she goes to fight. And she's, she's an animal, you know, as everybody knows. Mm. So it's not a big deal for me. I love, I love training her. Um, she's actually going to come on my show, um, you know, this week. So, you know, it's going to be good to actually talk to her from, from that perspective. And, um, but man, she's, she's an animal for sure. What's, what's your show about? What do you do on, on your show? What's it called? Etc. cetera. Yeah. So my show is Fight Strength Podcast. Uh, it's basically strength and conditioning for mixed martial arts. And I also have people on. I have fighters come on. A lot of my fighters, a lot of coaches in the, in the field, a lot of strength coaches in the field. We basically talk about everything mixed martial arts and mixed martial arts related. Sounds good. And is that like on, a, you know, on YouTube or iTunes? Yeah, we're on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, YouTube. And uh, we're just about to go on to iHeartRadio pretty soon. So you can catch it if you follow me. You know, I usually post it up, what, you know, what episode. We're on episode eight right now. So Yeah, I'll put all your links in the description and stuff anyways, which will be cool. Um, what do you think happened to sort of Ronda Rousey then with, obviously she got knocked out by Holly Holm and then went in with Amanda Nunes? <laughs> What, uh, what happened? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? She was like this feared... People were like saying, oh yeah, Ronda Rousey, Floyd Mayweather, like, let's get it on. <laughs> Do you know no. what I mean? <laughs> people were happening. saying it though, like... So I think that Ronda just basically got exposed. I think that um, when, you're the, when, when you're the first at something, you're probably going to be the best. Mm. Just is what it is. Um, I personally know Amanda... Amanda trains at American Top Team. I've trained Amanda. Amanda hits like a 170-pound guy, you know. So the the technical, you know, the technical way of striking, she doesn't have that. You know, she she's a, primarily a judo fighter, and she got away with a lot of that because it was so high level 
that girls didn't know how to counteract that. Um, especially the girls that just basically got into the sport, you know, to, you know, right away. And they haven't really fully developed their own sense of technique and abilities. Uh, it was so new in the beginning, women's MMA in general, and especially at that weight class, there were a lot of girls at, you know, the 115, at Adam weight, at 125, that were really talented, uh, that now are coming over to the UFC and Bellator. But, you know, the Bantamweight division was not that stacked. I mean, you had Cyborg was at 145. Gina Carano, I think she fought at 35. But that was the only, you know, true implication of, you know, true technique and, uh, and ability and skill that we've seen. And just, you know, with, with Ronda's ferociousness in the beginning, when she felt untouchable, when she felt defeat, it dropped her morale. And, she, and, I, and, I, and I've heard through the grapevine, I'm not saying that I know her or anything like that, but, you know, I've heard at the Olympic at the Olympic Games, she ended up doing the same same thing pretty much. Mm. Um, but I think when she felt that defeat, a lot of her, you know, her abilities got, you know, pretty much exposed. And then when she fought somebody at a higher caliber, you know, she really basically, you know, Crumbled. fucked. Yeah. You know? It's in history, you know, <laughs> it's there. It's there to be seen. Um I mean, obviously, I'm not like she'd kick my ass, but I feel like the way she approached the Amanda Nunes fight was she was thinking she's going to go in there and box this girl up. And it's just like, play to your strengths. Like, you're good at judo, obviously, but I think as well, like, without being too critical and harsh, she was probably the golden girl in a, a shitty era. Do you know what I mean? Like, ever the, the, the caliber's gone up. Do you know what I mean? The quality's gone up and... And that and that's that's in all MMA. Mm-hmm. That's not you know the the um, from when it started to now. Like you got kids that are fighting MMA right now. Mm-hmm. You know they're they're coming up. They're not coming up in wrestling. They're not coming up in jujitsu. They're not coming up in karate. They're coming up in MMA. So now you have specificity from a younger age. They're coming up now, and these kids like you know these younger kids that are like 21, 22, that's why you see them now. They're, at, they're in the UFC dominating because they've been doing it for such a long time where in the beginning you would start MMA at like 30. That was like the average age, you know. But now you got coming from like 19, 20. I got a kid named Jordan Young who's 20 years old, who's 9-0 and in Bellator, and he's and he's on the come up. And he's been doing this. He's never done anything else. So you know, they never played any other sport. He's only done mixed martial arts. So there's there's, you know, there's a different level to it now. And the thing with Amanda is that we all knew Amanda was going to fucking kill this girl, you know, but everybody thought that it was going to be a joke because nobody really seen Amanda let loose. Yeah. Amanda's a black belt in judo as well. She's a black belt in Brazilian jiu jitsu and she's a fucking damn good striker. So where are you going to where are you going to dominate at? You know, yeah, you might be very high level in judo. But you have to get a hold of her. And that mm-hmm. becomes you when you're not overpowering. And you think about it, a lot of the girls that she fought, she never really, she, she never, there was nobody that was really her size except for like Kat Singano. Yeah. And Kat Singano fucked that up because she just tried to run over there and, and, you know, and finish the fight too quickly and end up getting caught. Mm-hmm. But who knows if that fact, the fight would have went on, what would have happened. So you have to think about that, you know. And if, and if Cyborg would have fought her, it would have been even worse. To be honest, but which one we'll was see. involved in the um, the controversy with the weight cut? And there was like a documentary on her doing the weight cut. Was it Cat or Cyborg? I think it was Cat. I think it was Cyborg. Cyborg. Yeah, okay. Because... Yeah, and she was doing like the the drastic weight mm-hmm. cut. And I, th- I can't. I, have, I didn't watch the the whole thing, but I just saw her like on the floor crying, and she was getting in like super hot baths and. So the, the problem with that is if you ever seen Cyborg, Cyborg is as big as me, you know, uh, you know, and that's not dissing her. That's just like facts. You know what I mean? She's she's like five, seven, five, eight, you know, and, and very, very stocky. Like she she has some muscle on her. So to get her down to one 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 thirty five is a lot for her, man. She she walks around, I think, at like one sixty five, one seventy and maybe even higher than that. And there's not a lot of there's not a lot of fat to you know disperse. She has a six pack you know all the way around. So I mean, it's pretty tough. You know I mean, and, and where are you gonna pull that from? You're not gonna pull all that water. 
You know, there comes a time where it's diminishing returns. And, you know, she kind of felt that. Uh, it, I felt bad for her, but, you know, I feel, I feel like this is a good, good opportunity for these girl fighters that are higher in the weight class to, to really step up for 145, the 125 division. They just uh, they just passed a law that they're doing, like, a 195, 165 weight class now. Wow. So, I mean, I think that we're taking the steps in the right direction from a, from a, uh, to just keeping the fighters healthy. Yeah. Because uh, it's, it's not good. That's one of the worst things about MMA and, and combat sports in general is weight cutting. It's the worst thing. It's even worse than in head trauma, in my opinion, because there's not a lot going on from a repeated head trauma yeah. perspective. It's more about the, the drastic weight cuts you know, consistently throughout the year, you know, so that's, that's one thing that we need to really work on. I think that, that we're making a step in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, I showed my, um, my girlfriend, uh, a photo of Conor McGregor, like 145 and she was like, that's not him. And yeah, I was yeah. like, yeah, it is. And I mean, to put it frankly, he looked like a guy who's a junkie. Do you know what I mean? Like he's, he, there's nothing of him. And I'm thinking that can't be healthy. And obviously mm. since Aldo, he hasn't, gone down to that that weight again so maybe yeah. i think he's done with that division in my opinion you know i don't yeah. think he's cutting down to there no what what's the point i don't even honestly i think if you know i don't personally think he's gonna beat mayweather obviously i think i think i think floyd will stop him in six but from that perspective like he may not even fight again yeah. you know he may may ever again he has enough money if he wants to be smart and put it into businesses and be a you know uh, be a promoter or something like that then why not um uh, but i do respect his grind i do respect the way he started i mean basically from nothing you know and all the way up now to one of the one of the most famous and richest fighters in the world mm -hmm. so i'm not knocking him by any means you know but uh yeah i think that 145 is definitely out of the out of the uh out of the call out of the spectrum for what he wants to do man because at that time, man, if you keep cutting like that, you're going to have metabolism problems. Yeah. You know, your work could get fucked up. You really don't want to have that. I don't. I, as much as, like, people are in the unknown as well with, with after he fights Floyd, like, he's made money, you know. He, he, I, I agree with you, he's, he's going to lose. Like, I'm a bit of a boxing purist, and the list of fighters that Mayweather's beat, you know, who have boxed their whole life, like... Yeah. It just doesn't seem possible, but you never know. You know, I'll give him. I'll give him a one in a hundred million chance. But um, he's eyes. got. He's got so many fights with the the UFC, like you know the Nate Diaz trilogy, um, through the grapevine. Him and him and Woodley, um, him and I can't even pronounce his name. Khabib, <laughs> how have you said? You know, <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. he's got so he can come back to the UFC and make more money. Like, why why would you not want it? Well, I guess not really. I mean, you got to think about these guys, and, and I'm not talking about the UFC. Obviously, I I'm, I'm well versed in the UFC. I like I like all those guys over there. Mm. But you know, from a fighter's perspective, they don't make a whole lot of money. You know, um, especially the guys that are on main cards that are first starting out. Man, they're they're lucky to make. You know, they're lucky to make six figures if they do. You know, yeah. but um, and, and and that could be in the whole year. Not, I'm not just talking about one fight. No. You know, um, my first pro fight, I made two hundred dollars. Wow. I was, and I was the main event. <laughs> you know, um, it's not a lot of not a lot of money in in MMA. There's a whole lot of money in boxing. A whole lot of money. So he's smart to go to boxing, and he's smart to call out the most famous boxer and the most wealthiest boxer in the world, you know, um, he's going to make a good amount of money and he'll make way more money with this little, whatever you want to call it, than he would doing another trilogy with Nate Diaz where he possibly could lose that and tarnish his legacy yeah. through that. Where this, he's really on a, on a no lose situation because he goes into a different sport. He fights Pound for pound, one of the best boxers in the world. Even though he's aging, he's still one of the best. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to make money regardless. If he loses, he loses. If he wins, he's a megastar. So <laughs> you have to lose. Yeah. You can't. I wouldn't blame him. You know, if I had the opportunity, I would. But at the same time, uh, I'm not. I'm not really 
so excited to see the fight itself. No. I'm more intrigued on the show, the shit show that's going to be happening before and after the fight. Yeah. You know, how Other, how did he fucking how did match. he make that happen? How He's did talk. he get there? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like mad. It, listen, when you when you talk stuff into existence, it usually happens. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. When you say over and over and over again on a constant daily basis, usually it comes into fruition, it comes into existence. Um, and he's a prime example of that, man, you know? Um, I mean, I watched a documentary on him doing the, um, it was all about sort of how he'd grown and he was uh, using the book, The Living the Law of Attraction. Exactly. And mm-hmm. uh, I went and bought the book and obviously read it. And, you know, I, I'm a believer as well in that. Like the negative talk you can have and the positive talk you can have, the vibrations you send out to the universe, etc. Um, you know, I meditate it's, it's daily if I can. Obviously, you know, you should be able to fit a meditation in and try yeah. and center myself and focus on my goals. Um, mm. The problem I have is the negative talk and not implementing because you can you can talk all you want, but you still got to take action. Do you know what I mean? It's easy to talk. It's mm. harder to do. Simple, simple philosophy, really. Um, shit, I've I've run run low on my thought process. I'm gonna have to look to my question notes to fire away. I was on I was on a roll there. Give me a second, sorry. Um, five so, minutes, five minutes, and meditate for me, and you'll be back with great questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, shit, I can't even read my own handwriting. Ah, what motivates you to get others into shape? That was the question. Mm. Um, you know, when it comes to getting in shape, uh, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been doing this almost 10 years. And even before that, you know, up in my friends and my uh, teammates in the weight room at all times, I feel like I have, uh, there's more self-fulfillment when I can help somebody achieve their goals. Um, I even feel it more so than with myself. I feel like, um, you know, when I help somebody achieve their goals or I help an athlete, you know, achieve what they want to achieve or win a fight, it's almost even a better feeling than me achieving my own goals. And that's and that's a coach's mindset. I think that that's why I, this is, was my calling in a sense. Mm. I'm very unselfish. Um, I'm selfless, I guess you could say. And then, you know, what I what I love to see is that people I like when people it sounds funny, but I like when people depend on me to get them to where they need to be because I feel like I can take that that weight on my shoulders and carry them into their ultimate goals or visions um, that's just a leader mentality that's something that I've always had even when I was a little kid um, I, I was always the captain on all my teams um, you want to take I always wanted to take complete ownership of all of our sec- successes and our failures yeah. it didn't matter what it was so I mean being a coach if a fighter loses that's on me I didn't get him. I didn't get him well prepared to go out there and go to battle. That's on me. It's not on him, because he put his trust in me, or her, she put her trust in me to get them to where they need to be. And if I don't do that, then, like I said, we have some evaluation to make sure that we don't do that next time. But that's that's my main, you know, motivation uh, for for all clients, athletes, whatever you, whatever the case may be. Yeah, man. I mean, I can relate. Like, sort of with the it's like a pleasure to help someone achieve their goals and their dreams and, and the rewards you kind of get from that doesn't have to be sort of money or you know gifts or whatever it's just that satisfaction of like you're you're in the limelight that's cool i yeah. i helped you achieve that you know that you're grateful for that kind of thing and it is like self it's, it's rewarding like it's the same for me with what i do yeah definitely um, how did you train to, because I saw the video of you doing like a 600 pound squat, how did you even prepare for, prepare for that? Because that's, that's mad. <laughs> um, you know, commitment, dedication, obviously, for one. And then, you know, making sure that we're properly programmed um, and, and making sure that I'm, I'm progressing each day, but also managing fatigue. Um, it, it, it comes down to making sure that you have a program in place to help you progress each day. Uh, you know, if I decided to just throw 600 pounds on the bar from, you know, me beforehand when I first started powerlifting, I think at the end of my high school career, I started at, you know, I think at my, my best squat was a 405 squat 
wasn't really that much. Um, when I got to college, I started getting to the fives. And then, you know, for a long period of time, I stopped training to basically for absolute strength. I was more MMA based. Mm -hmm. So I would do more like five, three to five rep ranges for absolute strength. But that was before I even knew what I was doing at that point. Um, you know, growth happens every day. I learn something new every day. But the, the key thing is that once I learned how to properly squat with good, proper technique, 50 pounds went up on my squat immediately. And then after that, proper progression, making sure that we're taking deloads and uh, we're making sure that we're progressing on a constant basis. But every every rep, every set was perfect. Every it was technically sound on every set, every rep. This way I was, you know, when I got underneath that bar, it was second nature. It was it was basically unconscious competence at that point. Do you not feel um, sort of with the like weightlifting um, industry that a lot of people go for weight over technique like all the time without really understanding the precaution like the, the risks of that yeah I, I think I see it all the time on social media it's almost I almost like don't even really want to watch it anymore because mm. you're you're trying to take a shortcut route to make yourself look good and there's a lot of like foreign police out there too i'm not saying go overboard like oh he wasn't at competition depth on his squat or you know just make sure your your hip crease meets your knee crease you know what i mean yeah. something like that but you got to make sure that everything's properly aligned your back's tight you got a good brace on your lumbar spine you're you know you're spreading the floor apart you're not valgusing with the knees and this is just from a squat perspective we talk about deadlift and bench press all day you know but every 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 lift every compound movement lift needs to be you know, mechanically sound. It needs to have some mechanical efficiency so that you can lift the weight with the most, you know, with the most opportunity to lift the, the greatest amount of weight with less amount of risk. Um, and if you do that through proper technique practice, drilling it, you know, like anything in life, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be perfect when you get under heavy load. There's other aspects of that too. You want to make sure that you're able and capable of straining which is a big thing a lot of guys and girls they get on a heavy weight and just because they feel it's heavy they think that they can't lift it yeah just because it's heavy doesn't mean you can't fucking lift it <laughs> it feels heavy on my back doesn't mean that shit's come it's not coming up you yeah. know what i mean and mentality wise i'm never afraid of weight never been and i'll probably never will be you put 600 pounds on the bar you put 700 pounds on the bar i'm gonna lift that shit or i'm gonna die trying that's yeah. just the way and that's how I went in with the fight perspective. I used to fight, you know, I used to fight guys that were had, you know, undefeated records and this and that. With a calculated approach, I never feared the I never feared what I could control. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, um with with lifting in in the sense of social media, obviously I saw um a video of some uh bodybuilder and her coach and she was like doing a uh, leg extension and like locking her knees out like ridiculously with like heavy weight locking her knees like and I'm just looking at it thinking Jesus man like this this is not good you know <laughs> like, I'm looking and, and she's like crying this athlete you know she's crying she's obviously she goes and does uh, bodybuilding on stage she wins um she she won the competition it's all down to her coach but in the video like I'm looking at all the form and I'm thinking, is this really necessary? Do you know what I mean? Like the, the hyperextension, like around your knees and just, oh, it's not about that. Well, quad extension isn't, shouldn't be heavy. It shouldn't be a max effort lift. It's a single joint movement lift. Mm. You know, that's more for putting the blood into the muscle tissue, burning the muscle tissue out or putting the lactic into the muscle tissue. But other than that, you know, um, you don't want to go heavy on something like that. You know, it's it just it's not conducive to any type of progression or performance aspect. And plus, you're putting your knees at risk. You're putting your hips at risk. Um, it's just not it's not, you know, it, it was it was probably somebody that you know was doing it for the camera or whatever the case may be. But I didn't see the video, so I couldn't really tell you. But yeah. uh, I mean, I seen a lot of things like that. And it's unfortunate that anybody in this industry can be a trainer. They don't even need a certification anymore, which is ridiculous in my mind. You're not, mm -hmm. you know, you, 
you don't have a doctor that's working on fucking patients with no with no medical degree yeah. and no. It's you know, like you going and doing heart surgery, you know. Basically, you know. Like, oh, I've seen a video on YouTube. It'd be all right. <laughs> nah, is it? I, I have that problem over here. Or, um, you know, with we in the gyms and stuff. You've got big guys there. They're lifting weight and giving it the big roar, but their techniques all over the place. I've had friends that have had like slip discs. You know, they're they're doing a deadlift, not doing it properly, yeah. and then they're like, oh, I've got proper back pain. A week later, they're like, I've got a slip disc. You know, I can't lift for a while, and I'm thinking. Lower the weight, bro. Get your form right, and then before you know it, the weight will be slamming on. It's it's ego. It's an ego thing, and uh, you know you gotta be, you, you gotta have some type of. You gotta be humble, you know. Mm. Uh, but humble within the fact that like, you can't go in there thinking like, I'm gonna lift this weight because I want to look good for everybody in the gym. Yeah. You know? To lift the weight, I like. I like to see. I don't care how much weight's on the bar. And if you go to a powerlifting meet, if you go to a weightlifting meet, you really don't know what's on the bar unless, you know, you're really, especially in America, a lot of people don't know kilos. So mm. the bar could look like whatever on there, you know. But if your technique looks good, I'm like, damn, she knows how to lift. Mm. I don't care how strong, or he knows how to lift. I don't care how strong, you know, you may be. If you're technically sound, I know that you pay attention to detail. And that tells me you're a quality human being. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I agree with you, and and it looks better, and they, the the body will grow better as well. You know, there's nothing worse than having like shitty, you know, one arm's looking good on the bicep curls, the other arm's not looking so good, or one leg's taking more pressure than the other when doing a squat, and then suddenly your quad's looking a little bit bigger because no one's corrected it, and you're just like, uh, you need to sort that out, mate. <laughs> Do you know what I mean there's so many so many risks? with poor sure. technique that and people are so unaware they don't care until you know they, they get injured and I think as like coaches obviously you've got responsibility to deliver that but when you've got people that haven't even got a certificate and they haven't done any training they haven't been tested themselves you know with their own knowledge they're just out of this spouting shit it's, it's a risky place for the industry I think yeah it's it's unfortunate like I said and and um Hopefully it stops. I mean, there should be some mandated, you know, but it's it's not really going to stop, man, because you can, people are naive and people want to look like the guy that they see in the gym. And mm. even though that guy may not know shit and he's doing what he's done for years and it worked for him, which definitely probably might not work for you nine times out of 10, uh, they're going to go with that. You know what I mean? That's why I think trainers with the knowledge base and the practical application, they need to look the part. You cannot be some out of shape you know whatever that doesn't really train at all that kind of goes in now i know i have you know i work 18 hour days i train clients and athletes on a constant basis i will find time to get my training in and yeah. to get some sort of uh you know I'm, i say like in the lab like i like to be in the lab working on things in, in the lab just basically means i'm in my gym i'm in my whereabouts to where i can go over new exercises that's are gonna that are gonna help me they're gonna help my clients and athletes um but you need to you know practice what you preach you know quote unquote yeah that makes sense um i've got a random question what's your view on um like breathing techniques with say like lifting heavy sure. say when you've done your 600 pound squat and i think you went a little bit higher didn't you 650 was that with the bands yeah, yeah. yeah. um when you did that, like, what was your breathing technique like? So it's it's basically called diaphragmatic breathing. Um, what you would do is you have to breathe throughout your entire lumbar spine to create enough brace for your body and for your spine to be stable. Um, it, it's uh, an old Okinawan breathing, Okinawan breathing technique. Hmm. Uh, what you would do is you would basically fill up your diaphragm almost like a, uh, a funnel, right? As it fills up, uh, the, the, the air comes from basically your, your diaphragm all the way through and around to your lower back, and you create a brace with your own oxygen. Right. So you would fill up your stomach, because a lot of people, they breathe through their chest. They do it with a lot of chest breathers. You know, That's a stress breathing technique where people go, or something like that. Um, 
you, you don't really want to do that. It's not it's not it's not helpful for for any type of health reason, mm-hmm. and it's basically not going to help you lift heavy fucking weight. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you get a good deep belly breath in. I usually cue something like eat the air or something like that, so you could be like, <gasps> right or mm-hmm. So when I breathe, you shouldn't see my chest rise at all, right? It should blow up. You can't really see me through the camera, but it should come up from lower belly button all the way up to about the sternum area. Mm-hmm. And uh, from there, you know, you want to take a hard, like a hard brace, like somebody's going to come punch you in the stomach, mm-hmm. right? And that way you can brace down on the, on the core itself, the anterior core and your posterior chain. And uh, from there... Then you lift, you know, you get the bar off the rack, you take another deep breath in as much as you can, try to get as much air in as you can. You descend down into the squat. As you come up, you still keep air in that belly. You do not want to breathe out on the on the uh, concentric or the, the uh, concentric motion. And you definitely don't want to breathe out on the eccentric motion. Mm. Uh, once you finish the lift, then you can breathe out but still maintain a little bit of stability in the back so you can rack the weight. That's it. So holding your breath is like a simple way. Would that make sense? To an extent. It's, I know you've got the breathing techniques, but it's a simple the very, So what I would do is if you wanted to look up um, Chris Duff and stuff on breathing and bracing, look up Dr. Stuart McGill on breathing and bracing. They do a lot of stuff from a, a DNS standpoint. Uh, from the Prague School of Medicine. Um, if you want to look up s- something like that, it's on YouTube. You can check it out. But he, he kind of goes over the proper way to evaluate a breathing and bracing technique from the floor up. So definitely check that out if you really want to learn how to lift heavy-ass weight and be in, and keep your spine in check. Mm. No, that's cool. Um, did you ever go on the like stage for bodybuilding yourself? Because I saw your picture you've got like massive traps and you're just looking a bit a bit hench a bit scary how yeah, did so, you get yourself ready with that okay so this is what happened um this was kind of it's like six months after i ended up um retiring from mma so i couldn't really do much i couldn't do any heavy lifting i couldn't do any strongman training you know at the time i was doing strongman here and there um you know out of camp so i couldn't do anything that was going to put strain on my on my brain Mm. So volume training was something that I wanted to get back into. I wanted to build my body back up. I fought at 155 pounds. So, you know, I walked around at, you know, 175, you know, so, you know, so maybe like 60 kilos of that, something like that. Mm. But, you know, I walked around there and I was really, I was starting to get really skinny and I wanted to build my body back up to where I was when I was playing football. Um, so what I was doing was, if I'm going to build this muscle, if I'm going to go ahead and hit the, you know, hit the gym hard on a constant basis, I'm going to need something to train for. You know, mm-hmm. I'm going to need to, and I wanted to compete to fill that void. So, you know, somebody, you know, one of my one of my clients at, at my gym was like, you should do a bodybuilder show. And so, at that time, I was doing a little bit of uh, doing a little bit of modeling here and there. I was doing a pretty big thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so he was like, it was two people actually. It was a guy and a girl. He said, you know, you should do bodybuilding. So I ended up doing it and uh, did pretty well. Um, it was hell. I, I had to get down to 178 pounds. I built my body back up to like 210 or two, two, 210, 215. Then I had to cut back down to 178 to make the one to make the weight class and get lean enough to step on stage and look good. Um, but it was a, it was a constant struggle of dieting and training my ass off. And there was a lot of things that I had to be selfish about, which one that's not my style, which was really weird. Um, I had just had my son. My son was just born mm. maybe maybe four months prior. So it was a very selfish thing for me to do. Um, but at the same time, it was it was uh, it was going to help me in my uh, in my boy, my fill my void of uh, competing. And it was going to help my business, you know, so. I decided to do it. I did pretty well. I took second place in my uh, division, and then I uh, I ended up losing in overall to a guy that was heavier than me. But um, but I did pretty well, man. I came in pretty solid. Uh, I have some pictures up on my Instagram if you want to check that out. And yeah. then you know, but other 
had. It wasn't. It wasn't. I, it really wasn't my thing. I'm more of a strength athlete. Um, after I did it, I was kind of like, ah, you know, I gotta get back into strength. And once my once my, you know, my brain got pretty much cleared from the neurologist, uh, I was able to start strength training again and uh, started doing powerlifting. And I've done some powerlifting in in high school, so it was a, a pretty much an easy transition. But learning how to move my body at that weight now, um, you know, because I had went up to about 210, 215, where now I'm like 220, hmm. you know, trying to get up to like 230, 240 so I can get into the 225 weight class uh, or the 220 weight class and uh, really be a better force there because right now I compete around 217, which isn't really it's anything. So it'll give me a good Wilk score, which is an overall balance of, uh, of a pound-for-pound pound strength. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I just like to be bigger. I want to be bigger, but I also want to stay athletic. Um be able to move and uh from there that's it you know but bodybuilding was something that it was cool to, at, it was cool at the time as i was getting into it uh but afterwards i was like ass ah, not for me you know? yeah no, that makes sense did you have to like dehydrate yourself before going on stage what was the process like for that yeah so we of... did a carb, we did a carb cycling um yeah. i did four days straight of zero carbs egg whites and white fish this shit was <laughs> ridiculous um <laughs> The one thing I did do wrong was um, that f- the the competition or the you know the show was on Saturday, and Friday morning I probably looked my best, which was not what you want to do. You want to look your best on stage. Yeah. Uh, came in really dry, but I was overweight. I wasn't gonna make the weight class. I was 181, 182, I think, and I looked the best I could look. You know, um, from there, I decided to cut the weight by doing what I always know as a fighter is going to the sauna so what i did was i did a sauna session for about 30 to 45 minutes got the weight but then i flattened my body out so Mm -hmm. there was no pop in my muscle at that time um i didn't look as dry i looked kind of kind of wet in the beginning what basically means i didn't look grainy i had no like the, the 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 veins weren't popping out as much things like that when i stepped on stage i still looked good but i didn't look as good as i did on friday so that was the problem um, but the 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 build up to it was, you know, obviously calorie surplus to get my body body weight back up. I would do a whole bunch of volume work, um, you know, and it was like from set rep ranges of six to fifteen, and even into the twenties. And uh, I would do about an hour session there, um, and then I would come back again at night and do another session. And then when I got closer to the show, around six weeks out, we started doing double conditioning sessions. Which I had, I was my boy. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He he's a he's a uh, NPC bodybuilder and he's pretty. He was nationally qualified, things like that. So he helped me out with the the um, you know the uh, the competition prep. And uh, but basically what I did was uh, you know, got into a calorie surplus, got my weight up, and then we started to slowly decrease the calories over time. And then there's such things like little manipulations, like a cheat meal here and there, or a refeed, and uh, carb cycling, like we did. But it didn't really work for me. I think all those years of weight cutting yeah. slowed metabolism down so much that when I had to actually get as dry and as lean as possible, I had to go zero carbs for an astronomical amount of time. And it was just uh, I had no energy, felt like shit. I looked good, but you know, <laughs> it was it was. Like I could go, you know, hit a powerlifting meet right after that. I felt like ass. Like I, like I felt better with drag out, knockout, like crazy fights after after you know the competition than I did after the show, where I couldn't do anything. My wife wanted to go out and get drinks, and I just wanted to lay my ass down. I didn't yeah. want to do shit, you know. And I've had fights where I felt like I was gonna die, and after the fight, I felt great. So you know what I'm saying? So I mean, it's it's totally different. It's a different atmosphere. You depleted your body totally. And the difference there is that when you deplete your body of of all of its resources, all of its fuel, and you still have to maintain that throughout the entire day, that's taxing on the central nervous system. That's taxing on your body in general, on your mental capacity. And uh, man, it was just a, a it was a hard thing to do, man. You know, a lot of people. I give the bodybuilders, the, especially the the professional IFBB pros, I give them a, a tremendous amount of credit what they do because they have to do that day in and day out it's just not for me man you know mm. all right well, um I'm, I'm all out of things to go with um should we wrap it up yeah let's do you it happy with that 
All right, man. Well, uh, cheers for coming on. Massively appreciate it. Massively appreciate your time. I'll put all your links to your like Instagram and site and YouTube channel uh, when I upload this, so people can access your stuff. Cool. If that's cool with you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I'll chat with you off camera anyways quickly. Um, but yeah, we'll end it here. Cheers for coming on. No, no problem. Thanks for having me. Do, do, do.